Chapter 30 is all about the interplay between charges and currents and magnetic fields. And we're going to start with an example of what happens when you have a charge moving in a magnetic field. I'm going to take a charge, put it inside of this field, and give it some velocity so that it's moving towards the right direction. So we have some velocity in this magnetic field, and because the charge is moving inside of a magnetic field, it's going to feel a force. And that force is going to be a magnetic force that's equal to Q, whatever the magnitude of this charge is, however big the charge is, times the velocity crossed into the magnetic field. So this here, this V cross B, is a cross product. So it gives us a magnitude and it gives us a direction according to the right hand rule. And we can apply the right-hand rule if we put our fingers in the direction of the velocity and we curl them in the direction of the magnetic field, we find the direction of our force. And we'll go over this in class where I can show you more, more easily. But the direction of the force from the right-hand rule is going to be up. So this charge feels an upward force. That's going to push this guy in the upward direction. So maybe sometime later he's been pushed up by this force and he's moving now upwards as a result of responding to the upward force. Well now we do the right hand rule and we calculate what direction the magnetic force is going and we find according to the right hand rule our force is going to the left. So that's going to make our particle move towards the left and we're going to look at it a little bit uh, different position so we get arced around by that magnetic force. We do the right hand rule the right-hand rule shows us our force is acting down now. And let's just finish this out. The force is going to pull our particle down. And we're going to be over here and have a magnetic force that's acting towards the right. So that's going to drag our particle to the right. And we can finish out the, the path that this takes. And it ends up right back where it started. So this whole diagram, all these blue arrows that you see, all these forces, we get these directions from the right-hand rule in applying this equation. The magnetic force is the charge times the velocity crossed into B. So we got a direction from the right-hand rule. Now let's do some algebra with this equation and, and try to simplify and maybe see what kind of path this is, what kind of force we have going on here. We have our force. FB is equal to Q, and I'm going to get rid of the cross product V times B. And when I say get rid of, I don't really mean I'm getting rid of it. What I'm doing is I'm assuming that FB, the magnitude, is Q times V times B times sine of theta. Remember, that's the definition of our cross product, V cross B gives us VB sine theta, and I'm just assuming in this case that, that sine of theta is, is 1. So we're going to keep going from this assumption that sine of theta is 1, that our velocity and magnetic field are perpendicular to each other, which they are in this situation if you, if you look at the picture that we have drawn over here. You will see that V is perpendicular to B. So I take my force is equal to Q times V times B. I also know that force is equal to mass times acceleration. We know this from Newton's second law. So the mass times the acceleration is Q times V times B. I can solve this for A, the acceleration that my particle is feeling, by dividing through both sides by M, and I find an acceleration that's equal to Q times V times B, divided by the mass of my particle. So this is the acceleration that I get due to motion in a magnetic field. But this isn't any kind of acceleration. This is a special type of acceleration. If we look at our picture, let's draw our particle 
and he kind of moved around in a circle inside of this magnetic field. We just have a shorthand picture that we're redrawing here, and we notice that our thing, our little particle, moved in a circle, and the force at every position is pointing inwards, pointing towards the center of that circle. That should look familiar. That should tell us that this force, this F that we're getting, due to this QVB, is a special kind of force. It's a centripetal force. Centripetal because we're moving in a circle. So we can remember from Physics 1 that when we have a particle moving in a circle, the acceleration it experiences is a centripetal acceleration, and that's equal to V squared divided by R. So this acceleration that I feel, that I just solved for, the acceleration that came from the force, is centripetal acceleration. So I'm going to substitute that in, and I'm going to find that V squared divided by R is equal to Q times V times B divided by M. And what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to solve this for, for R. So I can multiply my R onto the other side to get it into the numerator. So my R's cancel on the left-hand side, and I find that V squared is equal to Q times V times B divided by M times r. I want to get my r by itself, so I'm going to multiply both sides by m over qvb. This is uh, basic algebra. We should be very used to this by now, so if you're having problems with that, come let me know and we can, we can work some problems. We can work through it. So my m times qvb cancels on my right-hand side, and I will find an equation for my radius that's equal to m times v squared over Q times V times B, and 1 V cancels with the B, V in the denominator, and my final equation shows me that the radius of this path that I get is M times V divided by Q times B. The radius of the circle I can make from a charged particle moving in a magnetic field depends on my mass, my velocity, my charge, and my magnetic field. So this ability to take a charged particle and make it move in a circle, to make it move so that its radius, r, is equal to the particle's mass times velocity divided by q times b, is used a whole lot in the field of physics in something called a particle accelerator. And it turns out what we needed to do uh, in this giant project, the biggest experiment ever done by mankind, was build something called the Large Hadron Collider. And in this, in this little device, actually this very big device, we take protons and we smash them together. And we smash them together at close to the speed of light. And if we look at this basic equation we have for the radius of these particles, how big the circle that we want our particle to be traveling in, we can see that we need a pretty big radius if we're going to send protons around and have them going at the speed of light. My radius depends on my mass, my velocity, my charge, and my magnetic field. If I do a little bit of algebra and shuffle this equation around to solve for the velocity. So I solve for the velocity that this particle has moving in a circle, and I find R Q B divided by M. If I want a very, very big velocity, I need to start with smaller particles. Proton is very, very small, has a small mass. But I also need to have a really big magnetic field and a really big radius. The purpose of this why do we need to smash protons together at the speed of light? One of the big purposes of this was to find something called the Higgs boson. And in essence, the Higgs boson 
is the reason things have mass. So to understand why mass exists, we have to find this Higgs boson. It's a fundamental question in physics, and it's something that was just solved last year. We have found this particle called the Higgs boson. We now know why particles have mass, and that will help us to explore new and interesting science questions. Now, if you haven't heard the term particle accelerator before, you might have heard it referred to as something called a cyclotron. In fact, you might have used cyclotrons in your uh, biology labs. The cyclotron works similar to a particle accelerator. It makes things move in, in circles. And what we do with the cyclotron, and the way we usually describe a cyclotron, is how fast it spins. So we describe that in terms of her frequency. And that frequency is going to be the speed that you go at, how fast you're going around, divided by the circumference of your cyclotron. So the cyclotron frequency is velocity divided by circumference, which is 2 pi times r. If I have a particle accelerator, so my radius is determined by a magnetic field for a particle accelerator, then I can describe this cyclotron frequency in terms of the aspects of the actual cyclotron. What does that mean? That means that the frequency that I have is equal to the velocity over 2 times pi times the radius of my path. And the radius of my path, we just found, is m times v divided by q times b. And I can see here that my m's are going to cancel out, and my b's get moved up top to the numerator, so my cyclotron frequency doesn't depend on how fast my particle's going through my particle accelerator. My frequency depends on my charge times how big my magnetic field is divided by 2 times pi times the mass of my particle. So cyclotron frequency is independent of your velocity that you're going at. To be clear, this right here, this frequency, is called the cyclotron frequency. It's how fast your cyclotron is actually going around in a circle. So if we can get force on a moving charge, we can use a similar concept to understand force on a wire. And we take a wire and I'm going to put it inside of some magnetic field. So I'm going to make a little rectangle and inside of this rectangle I'm going to make a magnetic field that's going into the page. Then I'm going to take a piece of wire and I'm going to run it through this field. This wire is going to have some current running through it. This current comprises moving charge, and since I have moving charges in a magnetic field, they're going to experience a force. And I can write the force that they experience, in general, it's going to be df, the derivative of a force, is equal to the current times some tiny little piece of length along that uh, wire, uh, current producing wire, crossed into the magnetic field. And this is going to be the most general definition for the magnetic force experienced by a wire in a magnetic field. And what we're going to do, we're going to integrate this across the whole length that's inside of my field. This is my entire length, we'll call that L, and these little DLs here are little pieces of length that add up to a portion uh, that, that are a portion 
of the wire that add up to the total length L. So when I integrate across every single little DL that I can draw, I end up with my total length DL. Now I can simplify this a little bit and write it a little bit less generally. I can write it as the force F is going to be equal to I times the length of my wire crossed into the magnetic field. Though here, it's a very, very specific L. This length L, and you can see how I've drawn that length L, is only the length of the wire segment that's actually in the magnetic field. We don't really care about the portions of the wire that are outside of the field. The only portions that experience this force are going to be the parts that are inside of the region where the magnetic field exists. So we have our two equations for the magnetic force of a wire inside of a magnetic field. Another useful thing that we can do with wires and magnetic fields is generate electricity. This is actually how most of the electricity in the world is uh, currently created. And what we do is we take a wire loop and we put it in a magnetic field. It's going to tend to rotate due to the magnetic forces that it feels. So the way this is going to work, we're going to draw a magnetic field. You see this in white. I've already drawn it. And we're going to take a wire loop and we're going to put it inside of this magnetic field. Here's my wire loop, and I'm going to generate a current in there that's going to flow around in basically the counterclockwise direction. So I have my current flowing around. The direction that the arrows are showing. And I'm going to put an axis in here around this, around which this wire loop can rotate. I'll label the different sides of my wire loop. I'll have this bottom side, we'll call it a length A, and we'll call this, uh, the, the sides, uh, length uh, small b. And what we can do, we can use the right-hand rule to figure out what direction the magnetic force on this uh, wire loop is going to be on my sides. The magnetic force is going to be equal to zero. This comes from the cross product, um, from the equation that we know for the magnetic force of a wire in a magnetic field, Fb is equal to I times L crossed into B. Since the current and the magnetic field are either parallel, uh, as, as we see on the right-hand side, or anti-parallel, as we see on the left-hand side, their cross product goes to zero, so we have no magnetic force. Alternatively, at the top and the bottom, we can use the right-hand rule to figure out that the magnetic force on the top part of this loop is going to be going into the page. And the magnetic force on the bottom of the loop is going to be coming out of the page. Again, we use a right-hand rule. We put our fingers in the direction of the current I. So my fingers go for the bottom loop. My fingers go to the right and then I curl my fingers in the direction of the magnetic field. My magnetic field is going up. And when I do this, I end up having my thumb pointing in the direction of my magnetic force, 
this is the right hand rule again, and my thumb is pointing out of the board. So I know my magnetic force is coming out of the board. And we'll see an example of this in class if you request to see that. So we know the direction that the forces are acting on this wire loop. We know this from the general equation for force on a wire in a magnetic field. I can calculate what this force is in terms of the variables that I have. The force is going to be equal to the current that's going around this loop times the length of the wire that's in the field. So the length of the wire that's actually experiencing this force for this bottom segment and this top segment are both going to be equal to this length A. So I have A times the magnetic field B from the definition of force of a current in a magnetic field. So the force I am experiencing is I times A times B. But what I really want to get I want to figure out what the torque is. Now the torque is a rotational force. So we need to go back to physics 1 to kind of draw some parallels and figure out what this means. Figure out how to get this force. How to get this force turned into a torque. So we've recreated our little picture up here in the upper left hand corner. And we'll keep this in mind as we recall that torque is equal to R times F times sine of theta, where R is the distance I am from my rotation axis. The distance of your force, whatever's making you rotate, from your rotation axis from whatever point you're rotating around. In this case, I can identify my rotation axis very clearly in the picture that we have drawn. My rotation axis is right here. My force is being applied at the bottom and at the top of this little rectangle. So I need to figure out the distance from this rotation axis to the place where I'm experiencing my magnetic force. Remember at the bottom the force is coming out of the page, at the top the force was going into the page. So I need to figure out this distance. If my entire distance of this rectangle is B, then half of this distance, the distance from my rotation axis, has to be B divided by 2. So my torque equation now is going to turn into B over 2 times F times sine of the angle. And now I already know what my force is. We just figured that out on the last um, little slide. So my torque going to be equal to B over 2 times I times A times the magnetic field times the sine of the angle between my force and my uh, rotation arm. This is the general torque that my bottom line segment is experiencing. If I want the total torque, I need the total forces that are rotating, that are causing this rotation. So that's going to be the torque from the top wire segment plus the torque from the bottom wire segment. And I need to add those two together. I can do that. The total tau, the total torque, has got to be equal to B over 2 times I times A times B times sine of theta is the torque for our top, plus B over 2 times I times A times B times sine of theta for the bottom. They both have the same magnetic force, they both have the same distance from the rotation axis, so the torque at the top and bottom are one and the same. So the total torque that I'm going to experience here 
is equal to I times A times B times sine of theta. Where I is the current in my wire loop. A times B, if I look very, very closely, I can see that that's the area of my loop. So the torque that I generate depends on the area of my wire. Uh, I, th I think I, I missed a little B here. B is the magnetic field. So you know, make sure that you get that corrected in your notes, get that in there. And then the angle is the angle between I, the current, and my magnetic field. In many cases, this angle is probably usually going to be 90 degrees. Not always, but usually. So this is our torque of a wire loop in a magnetic field. And this first term, this current times A times B, is so important and used so often, IAB, the current times the area of your loop, has a special name. We call it curly U. This is mu, the Greek letter mu. And it stands for something called the magnetic dipole moment. So you might see this torque equation, tau, written as equal to mu times b times sine of theta. Or, for very shorthand, tau is equal to mu cross b. These are all equivalent to each other. These are all the same thing. They all give you the same final answer. To get some practice with this and to study up on it, I would look at example number four. And I would look through checkup 30.3. Numbers 1, 2, 4, 5, and 6.